words of power because we are kings and our words matter. What should we do in order to get this bread of life? That question itself is wrong. See, the question is, what should we do? In Christianity, the, that question does not arise. It is not what I do, it is what God has done. The question itself is put wrong, and Jesus answered saying, Believe on him whom God has sent. Crucified. Laid behind the storm, you live to die, rejected and alone, like a rose, trampled on the ground, you took the fall, and you thought of me. Bibles and crucified, crucified, laid behind the stove, lived to die, rejected and alone, like a rose, trampled on the ground, you took the fall. Sam Chaladurai invites you to a special pastor seminar at AFT Chennai on the 20th, 21st and 22nd of January 2016 from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Please note that all messages will be in Tamil only. Prior registration with a fee of rupees 700 is required. You can register online at www.refsam.org or you can call us at the numbers on the screen. We look forward to seeing you there. Now let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31, where prophet prophesies about the new covenant that is coming and tells us what the new covenant is going to be like. Chapter 31, verse 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. Already there was a covenant, that's the Abrahamic covenant. But now this is talking about the new covenant. And he says, it's a coming covenant. It says, this shall be the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law. Now he's talking about what he will do in that covenant. Now notice, because here is where we have, this, we have the details of why the new covenant is a better covenant than the old covenant. It is described as a better covenant in the book of Hebrews. Why is it a better covenant? Why the promises are considered better promises? Listen to this. I will put my law in their inward parts, write it in their hearts, and I'll be their God and they shall be my people. 
They shall teach no more every man his neighbor, every, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Now, once again, I refer to you, refer you to this thing, the phrase, I will. One of the first things that I ever learned about Bible interpretation is, look into the passage and see the verse or a chapter or any passage that you're studying to see which phrase or word reappears again and again and again repeatedly because that's where the thing is. That is the point there. Now, if you apply that rule of interpretation, here the phrase that reappears, uh, that appears again and again is, I will, I will, I will. Look at how many I will. I will put my law on their inward parts. I will write it in their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people. You know. I will forgive their iniquity. I will remember their sin no more. It's all about what God will do. What will God do? Under the new covenant, God says, I will put my law in the inward parts. That was a real problem for the people of Israel. The law was written on a tablet of stone, but it never got to their hearts. It was a heart problem. That's why they could not obey the law. See, you cannot make a person love God <laughs> so that in their hearts they will love God, in their hearts they will love the commandments, out of their heart they will have a passion for living for God. So I will put my law in their inward parts. Write it in their hearts. Now can anybody do this? God says, I'll do it. Under the new covenant, I'll do it. That's what makes the new covenant a better covenant. And I'll be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more to every man his neighbor and every man, uh, no, more, uh, no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord. Now, in those days, every man could not directly know the Lord. So the new covenant is such a covenant where you don't have to put yourself in the hands of another person to know God. Even when you're coming and sitting here and listening to the teaching that is given here, you are not dependent on me to tell you what to believe. You brought your Bible, you have a ear to hear. On top of that, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And you have an enlightened mind and the Holy Spirit inside of you. You don't have to take anything that I say. You can judge it. You can hear and see whether this is the truth and see if it's according to the word of God and check it out and whatever is good you take. Right? Every one of you can know God by yourself. You can know God. See, you, you need teaching. God has appointed pastors, teachers and all of that in the church, given gifts to certain people to teach the word of God and so on. But you are not totally dependent upon those people to tell you what to believe. You have the Holy Spirit enlightening you from inside so that you are dependent on the Holy Spirit. Amen? How many of you are getting what, you, what, you, what I'm saying? That is, that is the thing that makes the new covenant a better covenant. One is the law is written in the heart. I can't do it. I can't write it in your heart. God says, by the new covenant, I will write it in their heart. I will do a work in their heart. They will love the law of God in their heart. They'll want to do what it says. And then he says, uh, I will, uh, uh, I, I, what I will do is, uh, I will help them to know the Lord personally. Every single person will know the Lord. So that no one has to say, teach me about the Lord or, or you know, I don't know the Lord. Everybody can know personally God. Do you know God personally? Yeah, you can, you can know God. You can talk to God. You can ask God. You can receive from God. You can get guidance from God. That is what I mean by knowing, all right? Thirdly, I will forgive their sins and I will remember their sin no more. I want to deal with that separately maybe sometime. But, uh, but the thing is, just note it down. I will forgive their sins and remember their sins no more. In the old covenant, the remembrance of sin was always there. That is why every year they had the day of atonement. Every year they confessed their sins over an animal and killed that animal, shed its blood and took it and sprinkled the blood. Every year there was a remembrance of their sin, Hebrews says. That is, that is the mark of the old covenant. There was a remember of, remembrance of sin. The mark of the new covenant is there will not be a remembrance of sin. Sin is forgotten. They remember it in some churches. But God says, I will remember it no more. Some preachers remind you of it. But God says, I will remember it no more. I'll take God at his word. 
God says the new covenant is a better covenant because I will not remember your sins no more. I will forgive, forgive your sins and put it away. I will not remind you of it anymore. If you're reminded of your sins again and again, you feel condemned and you feel, you feel bad all the time, even after you've confessed and left it, I tell you, my friend, something wrong with the teaching that you're receiving, something wrong with the way you're believing, because God says, I'll forgive it and I will remember it no more. So three things. One is, I'll put the law in their hearts. Second is, every man will know God. Thirdly, I will forgive their sins and remember it no more. Now let's go to Ezekiel 36, verse 25 to 27. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you. This is also a promise of what will happen under the new covenant. A new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I'll give you the heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my commandments and do them. That's the same thing, but more elaborate, right? So what is he saying? What is Ezekiel saying by the Spirit of God? He says, under the new covenant, I'll sprinkle clean water and I will cleanse you. There's going to be a cleansing that will happen where you'll be made clean. Secondly, he says, I'll give you a new heart. A new heart. And thirdly, he says, I'll, give, I'll put my spirit within you. I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I'll give you a heart of, uh, stony heart out, of, uh, heart out of your flesh and I'll give you a heart of flesh. A soft heart, not a hard, stony heart. So a new heart, a new spirit, and then he says, I'll cause you to walk in my statutes, in my word, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Now in Tamil, I like the Tamil version because I preached in Tamil this morning. It's very helpful to me because I get it in two languages. If I didn't understand it in one, I'll understand it better in the other. In Tamil, it says in verse 27, it says, he will, he says, I will make them do according to my word and according to my commandments. Now that's what they needed really. I mean in the Old Testament they failed over and over again. They could not do what the commandment said. You know, when God gave the Ten Commandments, they said, is that all? You know, we thought, you know, we'll have at least a hundred, you know. Only 10 will do it. And then when they went and tried to do it, they fell flat on their face. And they realized that they could not even, you know, keep these 10 commandments. No one had ever kept them. You know, they, they failed and failed and failed. Now under the new covenant, God says, I will make sure that uh, I will make you do it. I will give you whatever power and ability necessary so that you will love my word and you'll want to do it. You will not fail in doing it. You will successfully live this Christian life. So what is he saying? If you put those two things together, if you put Jeremiah 31 and uh, Ezekiel 36 together, what is he saying? He says a new heart, a new spirit, yeah? and under the new heart comes the law written in the heart and everything. So a new heart, a new spirit, and the ability to walk in the ways of God. The power, the ability to live for God. God says, I will give. And put this together with this, some of the stuff in, in Jeremiah, like I'll forgive their sins, remember them no more, and so on. And people will know their God. You got a, you got a full picture of what this covenant is all about. The new covenant is a better covenant because of these features. A new heart and Holy Spirit will come into your heart and live in your heart. and You'll be able to, ha you have the power now to do what God says. Your sins will be forgiven and they'll be remembered no more. And you will know God personally. These five things at least you can say in summary putting these two scriptures together. But again, if you notice in Ezekiel and in Jeremiah, the word, the phrase, I will, is the prominent phrase there. Again and again, it is I will. It is a unilateral commitment by God. 
that he will do these things. It is not about what you can do. It is about what God has done. Now we come to the essence of what Christian faith is. We need to understand what the Christian faith is. Sometimes, you know, we are in the church. Sometimes we don't understand. You know, I was in the church for so many years, never understood what the essence of Christian faith is. The essence of Christian faith is this. It is not about what I must do. It is about what God has done. This is what marks Christianity as totally different from others. You know. Remember Jesus fed the 5,000 and after the, he fed the 5,000, the fish and chips must have been very good, you know. So the people came looking for him the next day. They thought, this is O.C., you know. This is <laughs> free stuff, you know. And so, and it was pretty good. So they tried to find him the next day and he had crossed and gone to the other side of the sea. And he's ministering there. So they've, they took boats and followed him. It must have been really good, you know. Let's go for that fish and chips, you know. And they went there and Jesus, you know, knew why they were there. He said, well, you are striving for that which perishes, but I am come to give you something that doesn't perish. Strive, you know, don't strive for this, strive for that, he said. And he said, I am the bread of life. And if you will only eat this bread, you will never thirst, you will never hunger again. You will be satisfied forever and so on. He started preaching to them and telling them what he is all about. And then, you know what they said? What should we do in order to get this bread of life? That question itself is wrong. See, the question is, what should we do? In Christianity, the, that question does not arise. It is not what I do, it is what God has done. The question itself is put wrong, and Jesus answered saying, Believe on him whom God has sent. And I tell you, it, was, it felt like to them, like somebody let all the gas out, you know. All the air out, you know. They said, Phew, is that all? We thought he'll give a big list like our Pharisees, you know. Fast two times a week and give your tithes of even the masala. <laughs> and, uh, you know, do this, do that. And, uh, you know, wear your dress like this. And all these various codes of conduct will be given. They thought a big list will be given. Jesus will just print it out and just give it to them and say, go follow all this things, then you will have the bread of life. But Jesus said, believe on him whom God has sent. In other words, he says, there is nothing for you to do. Just believe on him who has come to you from God. Believe on me, in other words. They said, is that all? My God, you know, we thought we have to do something a, a lot. You see, the religious people have this thinking, you know, that uh, it is something about what you do. They're very happy when you give them something to do. <laughs> You'll find that among Christians also, you know. Some people like the church where, where they give something for them to strive for, you know. Have you prayed two hours every day? You know, when we went to church, you know, back in those days, you know, th these kinds of things were a lot there, you know. It is always about what we did, you know. What are you doing? You have failed, they said. You have not kept your part of the deal. The preaching went like this, you know. And you are no good. You are not faithful to God. You are not truthful to God. You are not living for God. This is the thing, you know. And I tell you, I, I went and heard everybody. Nobody ever told me what he did. They all, Christian preaching was about what I must do. In my house, you know, they, they always, you know, didn't let me rest during holidays. <laughs> because they thought holiday is coming, this fellow is going to ruin himself, you know. So they packed me off somewhere during the holidays. I said, there is a retreat, youth retreat, you go there. <laughs> Pay one or two hundred rupees, you know, make me eat there and go to Kunur or Uti or somewhere, you know, stay there. And three days of full prayer and Bible reading and, and all of that. That was good, you know. But the thing is, the preaching was, it's all about you are, f you are not faithful. You are no good. You are this. You are that. And I tell you, my head was aching because already my mother and father were telling me this. <laughs> I didn't have to come to Wooty to hear this. <laughs> Everybody knows this, <laughs> that I'm no good and, and all of this business. And I go all the way taking a train and land up there. Uh, 
and uh, they tell me I'm no good. I said, brother, I know that already, <laughs> you know. So <laughs> finally on the third day, there was a showdown, you know. Before you left, you have to make promises to God. So we had a session where we made promises to God, you know. So we, we were good at making promises, better than the politicians, you know. <laughs> we said, God, from tomorrow onwards, I'll pray two hours a day. I will fast at least one day a week. And I will never miss church. I will do this, I will do that. I'll go for the prayer meeting, for the Bible study. I will go for every little thing. Whenever the door is open, I'll be there, God. You can count on me. And every day from 8 to 10 in the morning, I will pray. You know. So we gave our name to God. We gave our time, prayer time. And, uh, you know, we told God we'll do this. I mean, we were lavish in the promises we made. And when we came, 8 o'clock, we were still sleeping, you know. <laughs> and can't pray even two minutes, you know. Even two minutes was very difficult. So <laughs> I'm telling you the truth, you know. And, and, and this is, you know, this is terrible. But through all that experience, no one told me, it's not about what I do, it is about what he has done. No one told me that he has given me a new heart, he has given me his spirit inside, that he has written his law in my heart. He has put an ability within me to do his will and to walk in his ways. No one ever told me that my sins are forgiven and they'll never be remembered anymore. Three days there was 30 remembrance of my sin. <laughs> you know. Nobody told me all these things. None of these things they ever said. They always pounded on me. You know, you're no good, you're not faithful, you're no good, you're this, you're that, and so on. And I came back with a heavy load of I'm no good, you know. And the Christian life, you know, after attending all the retreats and the seminars and all of these things and taking careful notes and everything, notes was the same thing, I'm no good. <laughs> I can summarize it in one line. <laughs> I'm a sinner. I'm unfaithful. I'm not worthy. This is what the thing, whole thing was all about, you know. They thought if you said it like that, somehow we'll reform. But what they were doing is they were putting the cart before the horse. If you know what that means. See, the horse is positioned, ready to leave, and you come and put the cart before it. And then every Sunday you take the whip. <laughs> From 9 o'clock to 1 o'clock you beat it, say, hi, you go. And they beat us all they want, and, 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 you know, we couldn't move because the cart is in the front. <laughs> Some people understand what I'm talking about. Maybe you've gone through that, you know. I know what it's all about because I've gone through that. Then I discovered something. It is not about the promises that I made. See, what the promises I made did was, I just lavishly made the promises. I, in my eagerness to serve God, I just made the promises. I could never keep them. Do you keep them? <laughs> We're good at making promises. I could never keep them. And whenever I fail, there was a big condemnation. I felt like worthless. I felt like I have no power to live the Christian life. I felt like I'm no good at all, you know. So I heaped condemnation on myself by making the promises and then failing and did this uh, all the time, you know. Making fresh promises, then failing freshly, and then making more promises and never being able to keep the promises. Heaping more and more condemnation, condemnation upon condemnation. Then I discovered it is not my promises, it is his promises that has been sown and given to me. I wish that someone had told me. It's not my promises, it is his promises. He has sown it and he has given it to me and I'm going to make it not because I have made promises, I'm going to make it because he has made certain promises. He has made the promise saying that he will cleanse me. What can I do then? I'm not going to go make promises and say, Lord, I will keep myself clean from now on. No, I don't make such promises. I go and I, I tell God, God, I thank you because you keep me clean. You cleanse me and you make me clean. You know. 
My sins are forgiven. That's the promise of the new covenant. So I go to God and say, thank you, Lord, for my sins are forgiven, and you will not remember it anymore, and I will not remember it also. I put it away, and I'll walk with you. I will not remember my sins anymore. I go to him and I say, thank you, Lord, for the ability to know you. I can hear your voice. I can walk in your ways. I can do your will because I can know you. Thank you, Lord, for a new heart, a heart where the word of God is written, where the commandments of God is written. Out of my heart, now I have the ability to do what God wants me to do. You have given me power to do what you want me to do. I thank you for the power that is now in me as a new creation to do what you want me to do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light And the burden of my heart rolled away It was there by faith I received Yeah. Uh -huh.